we can feel very out of touch with the people in history, people 200 years ago, 300 years ago. Um, like we can almost feel like they didn't exist or that these are just stories or myths that are told about what happened in this time period. But the reality is, is that we can almost sit beside them and hear their stories. And we can do that through uh, books, firsthand accounts, um, stories about what's happening to these people. And then, you know, if we really want to get in touch, we really want to get a feel for that. We can go to these living history sites. We can see these things portrayed. Today, I want to tell you a little bit more about the German soldiers that came over to fight during the Revolutionary War. Such a, a real interesting story about what happened in history, what happened to these soldiers. And the stories vary, you know, widely. We aren't told a lot about these kinds of things in, in high school. It's like, oh yeah, some German mercenaries came over during the war and, you know, that's about it. We don't, we don't very hear very much about them, about the soldiers themselves and about the story and their hardships and what happened to them. What happened to them after the war? Um, there's some great information uh, available out there. I've got a couple of books I'm going to read from today. Um, this is, these stories are so poignant and just about the idea about there being mercenaries. Probably most of these soldiers, they weren't really in the army voluntarily. They didn't ask to be sent over uh, to America to fight in this war. And many of them didn't even want to be in the military. Uh, and they weren't specifically paid to come over here. So while they were mercenaries in one sense, uh, they themselves, as soldiers, weren't being paid to come over and fight. Uh, other than being paid in their... Um, you know, their food and their, their clothing, and, and that's about it. These German soldiers came over from six different uh, distinct little, I don't know, principalities within Germany at the time. Germany uh, wasn't one cohesive country as we think of it, but as a bunch of little tiny uh, sort of small principalities with their own individual princes. And six of these regions uh, sold troops to the British crown, who was, they were in they were behind the eight ball. They needed to uh, have troops over in North America right away to start fighting this rebellion. And so they, they went to the German princes and they found about 30,000 troops that could be sent over to North America to fight. The first story that's incredible is the story of the way they get to uh, North America in the first place. And um, probably a great say a third or a half of the troops uh, get sent over in the first year of the war 1776 and apparently this this trip over was just plain harrowing it starts out uh they they they, they leave anchor about um may 6th or so from uh, england and they don't get to their final destination in North America until like August, August 11th or 12th. So they're uh, in these ships for something like three months and it sounds just terrible. Here's a little excerpt. They run into storms multiple times. Uh, lots and lots of bad weather. The wind and wa waves became more violent from hour to hour during the night of the 25th to the 26th. Uh, the Commodore gave the signal to draw in all sails except one to remove the uppermost parts of the masts. The ships were being scattered far apart in the cabins. All articles, though tied fast, were broken loose and thrown helter-skelter. The occupants likewise with many bruised limbs. And there was no end to the spells of seasickness, of misery made ridiculous. The storm was ever growing worse. On the second day, the last sail was drawn in. The rudder was bound fast so that now the ship was left to its fate. The raging seas were playing with the gigantic gigantic structure of the ships as with toys, sailors were swallowed up by the waters, others committed suicide, and the soldiers who ventured to go out on deck fell down unconscious because of the force of the waves. Not only did they have these storms, many times the ships were running into fog or other uh, violent situations and they smashed together and they thought different ones were going to sink and uh, they had to, to uh, pump the whole time that they were traveling, it was just horrible. And if you thought that the weather was bad, 
and that they were on, you know, on the seas for a long time. They had this problem and, of course, they had the typical problems with food. Uh, the the supplies, uh, because this was a fairly long voyage, uh, the supplies ran out, and toward the end, they were e they were down to partial rations. I think at one point he talks about um, they're down to eight ounces of hardtack a day. It was really bad. There's a diary of a um, of a German poet, an adventurer that has so he relates part of his time as one of these soldiers truly incredible uh he says um <clears throat> the decks the deck was so low that a grown man could not stand upright and the bunks not high enough to sit in the bunks were intended to hold six men each but after four had entered the remaining two could only find room by pressing in <laughs> he talks about the food he says today bacon and peas Peas and bacon tomorrow. Once in a while, this menu was broken by porridge or peeled barley, and as an occasional great feast, by pudding. This pudding was made of musty flour, half salt, half sweet water, and a very ancient mutton suet. The bacon could have been four to five years old, was black at both edges, became yellow a little further in, and white only in the very center. So you can imagine all these sailors uh, or all these soldiers on board these ships and the terrible time they had. Uh, there's a little section here where it talks about um, the Brunswickers. Uh, one of these areas, these little principalities was uh, Brunswick. And um, in February or in 1776, they, uh, they, this particular general set off with uh, 2,282 men. Uh, embarking and with within these 2,000 men there were also uh, 77 soldiers wives that went along with the regiment so it wasn't just these men but also sometimes their wives not every one of these soldiers was unhappy to come over to North America and pops in his journal writes this little piece this is uh, February 2nd 1777 orders were issued that the regiment should be ready to take the field in three weeks Colonel von Hoyt was assigned the command and directed to fill the ranks with young men from all the villages in the neighborhood this excited the laments of fathers and mothers and families who came every day to bid farewell to their sons and brothers and friends some of the soldiers were glad, and I was of that number, for I long wanted to see something of the world. Others were filled with grief and sorrow at leaving home, and there was on their side much sighing. So during this entire war period, about 30,000 men came over from Germany to North America to fight in the war. About 17,000 of them returned back to Germany after the war. So there's about 12,000 here that are, you know, we have to figure out what happened to them. It looks like about 1,200 of them died during battle. About 6,500 of them uh, died from illness or accident. And the remaining 5,000 uh, deserted or stayed in North America in one way or the other. One of the projects we've been working at here at Townsend's is bringing a few books into print um, that... Are helpful to people who are interested in these topics. Um, in this volume, we bound together three books: The Hessians uh, by Edward Lowell, um, The Voyage of the First Hessian Army, and at the very end of this book is Pop's Journal, uh, so that we get some little like first-hand accounts of what's going on during the war. Um, this is a book that is, I don't know, you know, five or six hundred pages. Lots of great information. Uh, I've got a link down in the description section. This is a book that's available on Amazon right now. Such great stories. These folks uh, in, in these past times, 200 and 300 years ago, they reach out and they want to talk to us. So all we have to do is listen. And it is, they, they've got such wonderful stories. I'm really having a great time digging into these journals and these stories about these folks two and three hundred years ago. It's wonderful. Thank you for coming along and joining me on this little journey back in history.